Brothers and sisters, friends, have a seat. It is really good to be with you and the many, many of you online this morning. It's good to be with you too. This every year is kind of a quiet week in my world, at least, between Christmas Day and New Year's Day, finishing up final things of the year. And I always start thinking about the next year and what the Lord has and what He's doing. And so we've got a simple and pretty short message today on gospel-centered goal setting. So we're going to take a break from the series we've been in on how Jesus brings doctrine to life. And instead, we're going to talk about setting goals and how the gospel changes that for us. And I'm excited to share what I've got here. I think the Lord has a good word for us. So let's break this up in three pieces, our heads, our hearts, and our hands. So thinking about goals, the reason for goals, and then how we go about doing some of those in a gospel-centered way. So number one, head. I have got just three quick reasons why setting goals is wise. Why is it wise to set goals? Number one, setting goals helps us become the kind of people who can receive correction and criticism. Let me give you a proverb on this. This is Proverbs 12.1. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but one who hates correction is stupid. Now, I tell my kids to not call people stupid. That's a pretty strong word. And here's the Bible saying that if you don't don't like to be corrected, if you don't receive being incorrected, the Bible says that is stupid. So far as saying that you are stupid. That's really strong language. We know that God loves us. We know he's a good father. So the Word of God would not be saying this unless He really, really loves us and wants to hear it. And so let me give you an example why this is healthy. Ashley and I set some goals for 2021. And so speaking of me, there's there's a few goals that I really kept and, and hit, and there were some goals I did not. And over dinner, we proceeded to have a conversation, and she was asking me questions like, well, why do you think you didn't hit that goal? And what do you think got in the way of that? And the more we talked about it, I came to some conclusions about myself to say, here's some some blind spots I need to pay more attention to. So one reason why setting goals is wise is, listen, even if you fail to reach those goals, you'll learn something about yourself. You'll be able to ask, why didn't I hit that goal? Why didn't that happen? What got in the way? And the Bible says it's wise to put yourself in a place to be corrected. Being able to receive criticism and correction is one of the main ways that we grow. So number two, why is setting goals wise? Setting goals helps us become the kind of people who are proactive instead of reactive. Proverbs 15, 19. A slacker's way is like a thorny hedge, but the path of the upright is a highway. So the image here, the Bible uses the word slacker. And here's the image. Maybe you've lived life like this before. Have you ever fallen into seasons where you just basically are reacting to life. That's all you're doing. There's no planning. You're just, the goal is to get up and do stuff and go to bed, and you're just sort of taking life as it comes. And the image here is, if you live in a pattern of that, life is like being in a thorny hedge. Just like always kind of just, no direction on where you're going, you're just putting out the fires. And the image here is, if, if we're planning our lives more effectively, this image of a highway of moving in a clear direction. So a second reason why setting goals is really helpful is when you set a goal, you only have so much time and so much energy. And so you're saying, instead of doing these three things, I need to do this. And it's like walking in a highway versus being stuck in a forest. And third quick reason why setting goals is wise, it helps us become the kind of people who don't get enslaved to cheap comforts. Proverbs 22, 13. The slacker says, there's a lion outside. I'll be killed in the public square. Now, that's a, that's a really odd proverb. What, what is this? Well, it's a silly excuse. So imagine if a person gets up in the morning and someone says, are you going to go to work today? And they say, go to work today? I could get in a car wreck. I could get sick. I might forget my lunch. My boss doesn't like me. I can't, I can't go to work today. You know, and it gets so silly, it's like there could be a lion outside, I might get eaten. And the image here is goal setting helps us put ourselves in a place 
that we're challenging ourselves a little. Right? Goal setting helps us not take this road of the slacker where we kind of always choose that path of least resistance in our lives. There's three quick reasons why setting goals from a standpoint of our heads is wise. Helps us receive correction, to be proactive, and not be enslaved to cheap comforts. Now, let's move on to our hearts. So setting goals is perhaps wise. Why should we set them? And how do we do that in a gospel-centered way? So let's start by reminding ourselves of what the gospel is. What is the gospel? The gospel is that by Jesus alone, his life, death, and resurrection, here's what you are. You are beautiful. You are valuable. You are eternally significant. You are righteous. You are holy. You are blameless. You're above reproach. These are all biblical words for what it means to be in Jesus Christ. The gospel is, here's Jesus' perfect life, and when you believe in him, you are hidden in Christ. So if this morning there's a part of you that says, I need more of this, I need more of that, well, you might need to grow in those things. But eternally speaking, if you believe in Jesus, no, you don't. You are holy and blameless and above reproach and significant and valuable and beautiful in Jesus. That is the gospel. And when we don't believe that, that's when idols spring up, right? When we're workaholics to try to gain something through work is because we're, we forget that we're in Christ and everything we need, we already have. And when we seek approval from other people and we get stuck in things is because we forget the gospel. But the gospel is not just that. Once you believe in Jesus, you receive the Holy Spirit, and you start to grow in your life. You're not growing to get God's love and acceptance. You're growing because you already have it, and you'll never lose it. This is so important. Let me say it again. You and me as Christians, we have to grow. You're not growing for fear that God is going to kick you out. You're growing because you're so overwhelmed by his fatherly love that he will never kick you out. And you begin to say, if that's how God feels about me, I don't want to settle for the dumpster of this world. I want what God wants to give me if he really loves me like that. That's how the Holy Spirit changes us. We grow not to get love, but because we're perfectly loved. Now, there are two major errors with the gospel. There's all these theological terms. I've named them two things today. We're going to call them moralism and me-ism. Okay? Here's the ditches we want to avoid as we're thinking about setting goals. Moralism and me-ism. What does moralism sound like? Here's what moralism sounds like. Have you ever been in a place where for whatever reason you can't receive someone's help? You feel like you can't. No, I'll do it. No, I can do it. No, I'll, I'll take care of it. And sometimes with God, we get to a place that we, in our pride, can't receive from him. And we start feeling things like, I can make myself worthy if I try hard enough. I can make myself worthy. And what would that look like with goal setting? Listen, this is so common with how people set goals. Some people think, I'm going to set a goal to save this much money. And boy, if I did it, I'd never worry about money again. Nope, that's moralism. You cannot save yourself with a savings goal. Hey, if I could get this healthy, if I could do enough exercise or do these things, then I'd always feel right about myself. No, you're beautiful in Christ. You don't make yourself beautiful with a goal. So often with goal setting, in a way, we're almost trying to save ourselves. If I could save enough, if I could take care of this, if I could fix myself enough, then I'd feel better. Okay, well, if you can't already feel better in Jesus, you're missing where it's really at. Right? It's in Christ. So we have to avoid moralism of trying to prove ourselves, of trying to save ourselves the goal. But on the other side, we have to avoid me-ism. Now, what does me-ism sound like? It sounds like this. If God really loves me, he wouldn't expect me to change in a difficult way. Listen, if my spouse loves me, they wouldn't expect me to change in this hard way. If my kids love me, if my friends love me, if they really care about me, why would they push on me to change? Now, that would be me-ism. In other words, God's love 
gives me a permission slip to just do what I want to do. And if you don't accept me, I guess you don't love me. That's the two ditches we're avoiding. See, in the gospel, you're perfectly accepted and loved by God, and therefore we begin to change because his love changes us and we... We're accepted, we're beautiful, we're wanted, we're significant because of Jesus and Jesus alone, so we start living differently. But the ditches we have to avoid is, well, I'm going to earn it. I'll be good enough. If I could get there, I could fix myself, I could control my future, I could calculate all the suffering out of my life. If I just set good enough goals and met it, I wouldn't be anxious anymore. I'd feel better. I'd be fine. No, you won't. No, you won't, because your own performance is never going to save you. Jesus and Jesus alone will bring you peace, not meeting your goals. On the other hand, if we never set goals and never go and just say, listen, if people love me, they just accept me, okay? That's me-ism, right? That's what Paul says in Romans 6 when he goes, well, if God's grace covers all sin, the more I sin, the more grace I get. Let's do that. Right, that would be me-ism. That's what we're trying to avoid. Let me give you a couple of scriptures to think about this, about our hearts in goal setting. 2 Peter 2.19. Listen to this verse. This is a powerful verse. People are enslaved to whatever defeats them. That, that is convicting to me. See, Peter says, listen, if, if there's a repeated pattern in your life or, or things that you're trying to work on that you're consistently just defeated by, Peter doesn't say, hey, it's okay, it's a small thing, don't worry about it. He goes, no, 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 you're never going to get better, you're never going to grow if you can't look it in the face and say whatever is consistently defeating you, you're enslaved to it. That's strong language. But that's helpful for us to repent and to grow. This is what we have to use to fight against meism, right? Of, uh, you know, if people love me, they just accept me, everything is fine. No, if, if you're being defeated by something, there is some form of spiritual slavery there. Now, Matt read Romans verses 6 and 11. Let's read those again. Romans chapter 6, verses 6 and 11, and we'll see how this is valuable too for thinking about setting goals. Up on the screen, Romans 6, verse 6. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin. And then verse 11. So you too consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Okay, this word consider is huge and I'm hoping to to punch it into you. I was trying to think of a good metaphor for this. When I got married... It was 16 and a half, almost 17 years ago. Yeah, it's 2005. So I remembered we got married, and uh, it's a long day. When you get married, it's a long day, right? All these people, you're shaking hands. Some of them, you're like, I don't know you, but thanks for the gift. Really appreciate that. Eating food, doing your first dance, you know. We, we do the whole thing. We go to bed, and there was a point at, in that night where I woke up, uh, I was just so exhausted, and I wasn't in my house, right? We're in some, some hotel somewhere. And for a moment, I forgot where I was. Uh, and then I put together, I'm married. And she's right there. She's right there. You know, we've, we've never done this before. You know, she's, she's here. But there was a moment where even though it was true, it didn't feel real. Even though it was true... I was sort of confused in this room that wasn't mine, kind of waking up groggy. Now, Paul is saying, see, in verse 6, he's saying, your old self is crucified. If you're a Christian, you are not the you before Jesus. You aren't. You might think you are. You might say, well, my name has always been Ryan McCoskey. That's great. You were buried, and you're new. Whether or not you think it or feel it, it's real. If you're in Jesus Christ, the old you is dead, there is a new you. And Paul goes so far to say the power of sin is rendered powerless. 
So if we're stuck in sin, if we're being defeated as Christians, it's because we're going into the jail cell and we're trying to click those handcuffs back on and they won't stick because you are free. However, we might say, Ryan, that doesn't seem true though because I get stuck a lot. Well, so do I. We all do. The Bible knows this. God is gracious. Right? What, is, what does John say? I tell you these things so you will not sin. But when you do sin, Jesus Christ is our righteous advocate, right? Listen to verse 11. So you too consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. It's not automatic. We have to consider or remember the old me is dead. I'm new. And there's something about living in that space of remembering the truth of the gospel that wakes us up. Uh, kind of like me waking up in that room and forgetting where I was. It kind of, oh yeah, that's right. I'm hidden in Christ. I'm holy. I'm free. God loves me. You see, this is the heart posture of setting goals as Christians. You cannot control your future by setting good enough goals. But if you don't ever set goals or, or something like that, you could get stuck in a space of just me-ism, of just this is me and this is just who I am. So let's go on to hands now. We've talked about heads, setting goals is wise, our hearts, how to do it with a gospel-centered posture, and now our hands. And here's how I'm going to do this. I'm just going to ask some really super simple questions for you to think about. And this week, here's my encouragement. Take a little bit of time to think about maybe setting a goal or two for 2022. Let me give you a list of some areas that are common problem areas in our culture, and maybe it'll help you think about setting a goal. Number one, social media or technology. Do you have trouble with that? Do you have trouble with mindless scrolling on occasion? Do you find yourself comparing yourself to others? Do you feel kind of hollow after spending a lot of time on a phone or a computer? That's super common in our culture. I even told Ashley the other night, I have this habit in the morning that when I wake up, one of the first things I do is click the news button and see what new articles are out there. What I love about that is everything is so encouraging and Christ-centered. There's no negativity in the news. But I can find myself re like reading headlines of articles, and before I get out of bed, I'm kind of like, oh, yeah, you know, a bad day. So... That can be a problem for lots of us. It's easy for social media and sort of the digital world to almost become more real than our real lives because we spend too much time there, right? Maybe there's a goal there, like setting some time limits or something on your phone. Secondly, food or drink. Any issues with food or drink? And there's two problems here. We'll call them comfort and control. When we have comfort problems with food and drink, we overindulge using them to bring peace, to bring comfort, to help us. But control issues is we don't enjoy what God has made as a gift, and we use it like a mathematical calculation just to look and feel a certain way because we're using our body as like a form of approval. And those are both so control problems is like eating disorders, and comfort problems is like just being unhealthy because we're overusing them. Are there any food or drink goals to set, right? That's just two examples of, of things that can, very common, can show up in all of our lives. Number three, money or materialism. Do you find that money feels like security to you more than Jesus? Does money feel like status to you? Do you have a lot of anxiety about wealth and resources? And God gives us something great here. Uh, for us to do. So just, th this is true. Even non-Christian psychologists and sociologists have noticed something amazing. They studied New York, which was like the richest state, this was a couple years ago, the richest state in, in the United States, and uh, Mississippi, which was the poorest. And as they studied people's incomes, they found out the more a person made, percentage-wise, the less they gave away and the less a person made, percentage-wise, the more they gave away. And they were looking at trends of anxiety and depression, and they found this. Christian or not, the more of your money and stuff 
that you use on you, the less happy you are. This is true. This is just true about what it means to be human. And so if you're hearing me and going, well, I think I do have some, st- some status, some security, some anxiety issues, Jesus is saying, be more generous to the poor, to your friends, to the church, to one another. Maybe you need a goal around that, around setting budget, right, or, or, or giving. Uh, next one could be reputation or success. This would be like work-life balance issues. Uh, so wanna, uh, to be very transparent and open with you, one of the goals I did not meet uh, was number of date nights with my wife. And I am one flesh with Ashley, not with the seed. Uh, the, the church ought not be a mistress, but the body of Christ where I serve. And I was telling Ashley um, that planning date nights often feels like work to me, which made her feel really good to say that to her. <laughs> no, we've been married long enough now. We've been married long enough now, and we've failed enough times now that we can say those things and feel emotionally safe. But um, once I'm on a date night, I love it. I love being with her, but don't plan them enough. I said, I think part of it is the creative fatigue that comes from writing sermons and shepherding and being with people and just feeling tapped out. And so needing to do a better job of not giving all my first fruits to work. Maybe we need a goal there, right? What's it look like to build a goal that work doesn't seep out into every part of our life? On the other hand, some people's vision of success is I always want to do the least. I just want to hang out and have fun and just barely skate by. That's not healthy either, right? In in the book of Genesis, work comes before sin. Work is a gift. And so if we're not working hard, if we're not applying ourselves, that's also unhealthy, So are there some goals around appropriate work and and work-life balance? Um, Next one. I just got two more quick ones. Solitude and friendship. Solitude and friendship. Some of you here have what's called a high relational thermostat. What that means is if you don't feel really close to people, you don't feel okay. And some of us have a really low relational thermostat, which means we can talk to a person once a week and not know much about them and say, they're a great friend, right? And there's those different things there. And here's what happens. If you have a high relational thermostat, you often don't practice much solitude. You you struggle to process emotions, to have a vibrant prayer life, to have an inner life that's calm because it's always full of people and interaction, right? But on the other end, If someone has a low thermostat, they spend a lot of time alone and a lot of time thinking. And then when something goes wrong in their life, they say, no one's here for me. Well, the reality is no one's there for you because you don't know anyone very well because you're not that connected, right? And so a goal we can set is if your natural tendency is kind of that lower relational thermostat, hey, I can just talk to people and stay on the surface and feel connected. You might want to lean into some friendship this next year. You want to set a goal. Have coffee with a friend once a month. Don't call them about doing something. Just say, I want to spend time with you. And you go, that feels uncomfortable. Well, good. Set a goal around that. Lean in. But maybe for some of us, if you have a real high relational thermostat, get some time for solitude, for prayer, for alone time, for riding a bike alone. Is this making sense? That's examples. Final one. And this is like a catch-all. All I have here is anger irritation, and impatience. Given where our culture has been, I don't know if if you feel this way, but kind of like early on in the pandemic, and for quite some time, I felt emotionally okay. I was like, I can tell people are kind of freaking out, but I feel pretty steady. But there have been moments and times and days where I'll just find myself really irritated. Just irritated, right? Um... And so maybe we need to build some goals around just emotional health, relational health, right? So maybe do a a bit of a a survey. That's not the right word. Do like a status check on yourself this week. Uh, You know, have I been lacking patience? 
irritated, dealing with some anger, how do we build some goals that kind of helps me move toward health? Goals move us beyond intentions to something measurable that we can do. And so we have to ask questions like, what should I stop doing? What should I start doing? What rhythms need to change? And here's the last one that's probably the most important. And then we'll, we'll move toward finishing and praying and singing together some more. And uh, you can have this next week to set a goal or two. Who are you going to be accountable to for any goals that you set? That's the most important question. Who would be accountable to? Maybe a gospel community. If, if you're a GC leader here or online, maybe you can try to, if the GC feels like it's an emotionally safe enough space, hey, did anybody set some goals? Do we want to help each other through spring to try to meet those goals? Maybe a close friend, a spouse. Once again, friends, if you don't have some level of accountability, the problem is it's really easy to fade and then you won't learn about yourself. Listen, if you start fading from a goal, it's good that someone says, what's going on? Because then you can receive some correction. You can learn about yourself and see that you have some blind spots. And if you're afraid of doing that, you're never going to grow. You will never grow. And in fact, you won't get much in the Bible either. Because when you spend time in the Bible, God, he corrects us, right? If we always move away from seeing where we stumbled or failed, we're not going to grow in receiving. So if you do set some goals, and I encourage you to set at least one or two, share those with someone who can help you stay accountable to those things. Once again, friends, we're not doing this because God will kick you out if you don't do well enough. You've got to get that out of your heart. That's what the enemy does. The Father doesn't work that way. But if you really are in the household of God, and you've been adopted in, and the Holy Spirit's in your life, there's going to be the Holy Spirit's work in there moving you toward growth. And so setting goals is a real practical way of helping us do that together. So brothers and sisters, uh, I, I wish you huge blessings uh, and God's presence this week as you sit down and think about that a little bit of maybe setting a goal or two. Hey, and, and honestly, if you want to talk to my wife or I, we've we really got into goal setting the last two or three years, and we've, we've failed more often than succeeded. We really have. Um, and so if you want someone to maybe talk to about what some of that looks like, feel free to reach out. We can try to schedule a time to talk or do email or something. Um, we as Christians should be comfortable with the fact that we need a Savior and that we're not perfect and that we're always kind of falling forward. That's what it means to be a believer, right? Right? We're trusting Jesus, not ourselves. All right, friends, pray with me. We're going to sing some more, do communion, and uh, enjoy this little time together. Father God, we magnify you and worship you for being the almighty, perfect, beautiful Father who lives in unapproachable light. In Jesus Christ, we magnify and worship you for being the Son of God who came to die for our sin and save us. And Holy Spirit, we magnify and worship you for being our perfect counselor. God, this morning we ask for wisdom from you, Lord, that as we think about turning over a new year, God, that we would do what Paul says, where he says the time is short. So live to the glory of God. God, would you help us to heed those words Lord, to not let our lives just kind of happen to us, but God, that we would have some direction, set some goals, and think deeply about walking in healthy patterns to become more like your son, Jesus. God, I pray against uh, the spirit of moralism. God, your son, Jesus Christ, was the most clear directed person in all history and he still suffered and so God no matter how much we organize ourselves or how well we meet goals we cannot calculate hard times out of our life God they're going to come and you are faithful 
So God, get, the, get moralism out of our hearts that if we just tried harder and did better, life would be easy and we wouldn't struggle and there'd be no troubles. Lord, that is false. That is a lie from the enemy. God, we also ask, though, that you would get the me-ism out of us. Lord, that kind of causes us to coast. And, um, Lord, to build our lives around our comforts. So, Lord, would you meet us in the coming days as we think about the new year and help us look at our lives and see where we can partner with your spirit to grow. God, we thank you for how much you love us, that you're such a good God. We praise your name. Amen.